um, would have been grateful. Rusty's favorite. But um, I've taught it so many times <laughs> the same way. So I've been reading a book. How many of you know Christy Williams? Mm -hmm. God forgive us. Uh, Saint, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, she had given me a book a long time ago. I mean, a long time ago. And it's just called Forgiveness, and it's by a man by the name of Gary Henry. And um, about, I don't know, four or five months ago, she called me. She said, do you still have that book? And I said, no, I, I don't even remember having it. I don't know what you're talking about. Didn't. Totally had forgotten about the book. And I was cleaning up in the living room here, I don't know, a few weeks ago. We're going through, how many of you have a magazine rack that's full of junk? Or I've got these baskets, these bushel baskets with magazines and photo albums and just everything. And anyway, I got to digging around in there. There was a book. So I had to call Christy. I said, I am so sorry. And she said, oh, that's okay. I don't need it right now. She said, just keep it for a while. So I've been reading it. And I'm about halfway through it. So you're getting part one of forgiveness tonight. <laughs> based on the book by Gary Henrik. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's a man's definition, and, you know, it's his opinion, a lot of it, but it's also based on the Word. There's a lot of scripture in this, and um, I just thought it might be, we have a forgiveness lesson and, and celebrate. Shirley reminded me I taught it not too long ago. <laughs> but this is kind of a different slant or a different bent on it, maybe, you know, we're going to talk about some different things. Um, Jesus died on the cross, not because something was wrong with him, but because everything was wrong with us. That's a quote from this man, Gary, and I think that says it all right there. You know, Jesus didn't do anything wrong, you know, but we did everything wrong, and that's why he died on the cross. And that's a powerful statement, I think. Um, in Isaiah 53, 14 to 15, it said, Surely, and this is NIV, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And once again, that's Isaiah 53. So I want you to think of it like this. And this is like, I've got to have clean it. Pastor got me crying before I got started. <laughs> and I'll say it the first time and then we'll say it together. He was wounded for Julie's transgression. And he was crushed for Julie's iniquities. So let's say it together and you say your, your name in there. He was wounded for Julie's transgressions. He was crushed for Julie's iniquities. So that, I think that really drives it home when you put your name in the blank there. Uh, it's, just, it's the same thing about a lot of times you've heard it said, and I've said it, Pastor said it, I think, that if there was nobody else on the earth, he would have died for me. And it's the same thing here. This is why he died, for my transgressions and for my iniquities. He was criticized for being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend to tax collectors and sinners. That's from Luke 7. Of course, he was not a glutton and he was not a um, drunkard. We know that. But he was a friend to tax collectors and sinners. He made a regular practice of hanging out with the wrong kind of people, so to speak, you know. Jesus loved the sinners. Excuse me. He was notorious for his openness to all kinds of people and his indifference to merely traditional practices like those of the Pharisees. Okay. So we're going to talk about forgiveness a little bit. People who truly accept forgiveness, God's forgiveness, should be a very grateful people. Overwhelmed. We should be overwhelmed by the gracious forgiveness of the Lord Jesus that has set us free of condemnation and guilt. We should be overwhelmed by that. You know, how many of us would want to give up our child, you know, for somebody else's sins? And um, until we come to this point in accepting forgiveness, how can we ourselves truly forgive? You know, I think we have to be able to know how to accept his forgiveness before we can really forgive. There's a song called Awesome God, and it's not the one that we traditionally hear all the time. But I think it really says it all. You truly love me. You truly do. You pour yourself right into me. And Lord, you see right through all the secrets of my heart. 
All my weaknesses and everywhere I fall apart, you truly love me. You still forgive me. You truly do. I miss the mark a million times. I fall so short of you. All my worry, all my pride, all this envy, and all the things I wish I could hide, you still forgive me. I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but he lives in me. Every breath I freely give, I live through faith in Christ, who gave up himself for me. And that's three verses there, and then the chorus says, what an awesome God you are, what an awesome God you are. You truly love me, you still forgive me, you truly love me. This tells me that's what forgiveness is about. It's about unconditional love, agape love, like Jesus has for us. It says in 1 John 2, 1 through 2, My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So we've got to remember that we don't live under that old eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth covenant anymore. We live under the new covenant, and we live under love your neighbor as yourself, and turn the other cheek, which is really a hard one, <laughs> and forgive 70 times 7. Those are the things we live under now, not the old covenant. If we can accept that he is our advocate to the Father and that God sees Jesus in our place, when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. Jesus is standing in front of us. So God sees his purity and holiness, perfectness. And not, you know, he doesn't see our human unworthiness. He sees Christ. Then and only then can we be able to forgive ourselves and others. I was listening to a Creflo Dollar message late, not too long ago. I really like Creflo a lot. I don't know about anybody else, but awesome. I love to listen to him. <clears throat> and I'm paraphrasing this. I don't have an exact quote or anything, okay? <laughs> but uh, he said that God saw that no one could keep the Ten Commandments all the time. Mm -hmm. Not all the Ten Commandments all the time. <laughs> And it's been proven over and over again in history, hasn't it? I mean, you know, just, just read the Old Testament and, you know, it's about all you have to do. <laughs> of course, they and, um, and other commandments in the New Testament are certainly a benchmark that we need to strive to achieve. I mean, you know, we need to strive to achieve holiness and we need to try to uh, achieve all those things that the Ten Commandments ask us to do. Um, but, you know, he also saw that blood sacrifices in legalistic ways were not working. And so he sent his only son, whom he loved, to become the ultimate blood sacrifice once and for all for us. In this book, uh, Mr. Enrique further discusses what he categorizes as two types of forgiveness. He says there's judicial forgiveness and then there's relational forgiveness. <clears throat> he states that by God's grace, in Christ, we are the recipients of judicial forgiveness. And that just means that we have perfect right standing with God. In other words, our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life once we accept Christ. But family or relational forgiveness is about my ongoing enjoyment of a warm, intimate relationship with my Lord Jesus. It's a lot deeper than, you know, just, okay, you've accepted me, so you're forgiven, you're, you're going to heaven. But it expands into that deep, intimate, personal relationship that we get through prayer and through His Word. A healthy family relationship requires consistent extending and receiving of forgiveness. Saying, I'm sorry, and saying you're forgiven. You know, a lot. <laughs> so how do we receive this forgiveness? Well, the judicial forgiveness was given as a pardon once for all. When Christ died on the cross and we accepted him, you know, and he rose, of course. And we'll leave that part out. That's the important part. <laughs> True relational forgiveness comes from confession. And confession of sin is not a one-time thing, like accepting Christ is. Not that we aren't supposed to go ahead and get deeper into our relationship with Christ. I don't mean that. 
But a relational forgiveness means that we, every day, confess, Lord, I know I've done things wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. And what I didn't know I did wrong, you know, I'm sorry. You know, we've got to do that over and over. A confession of sin is not an occasional event for a Christian. That's basically what I just said. But a continuing lifestyle becomes a lifestyle of, of saying, I'm sorry, I did wrong. Please forgive me. We deal in Celebrate Victory a lot about making amends and uh, making amends for our past sin. But the Word says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that tells me the Lord knows that we're going to keep messing up. You know, we're going to blow it from time to time. It's just a fact. And he knows that. Should we strive for holiness? Absolutely. But will we still fall short? Of course we will. Because, you know, we're not perfect. We're not God. Which brings me back to principle one. Always. <laughs> realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. And I always add, without God, to that. My life's unmanageable without sure. Him. And as Pastor spoke on Sunday, we can strive and strive and strive to do everything by the book and be perfect and walk, walk on eggshells afraid we're going to make a mistake and try to be sure we never blow it and beat ourselves up all the time about it when we do. And that's all a lofty goal to try to do things right. We know that. But if we're obsessed with it to the point we become legalistic in our approach, we've got wrong motives, and we can lose our joy very easily. Lose our joy. This is the prayer we all, I think, should pray every day. And I, I'm going to really start among other things, but I, I really like this. It's Psalm 138, 23 to 24. And it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a great prayer, prayer confession right then, there. If you don't know what to say, just look up Psalm 138, 23 to 24, you know, and repeat it till you get it into your spirit, you know. If we ask forgiveness with a broken and contrite heart and in sincerity before the Lord as the psalmist above did, the Lord's going to be faithful to forgive us. He said he would in his word, so why would he not be? It's a promise in his word. He's going to be faithful to forgive us. Forgive us. Once we've accepted our forgiveness, we can move on into being a better forgiver. You know, um, The writer of this book said... When I refuse to forgive another, I allow the person and the past event to have a controlling influence on my life. I never get rid of it. Think about that. When I refuse to forgive another, I allow the person and the past event to have a controlling influence on my life, and I never get rid of it. For example, and I'm just going to be real, like Pastor said, we should be real. And this is going to be on YouTube, so... Sorry, but maybe it'll be effective. Maybe this is my way for asking forgiveness or giving forgiveness. But when we were at Cornerstone Church and we had the split, uh, I hardly would go to the grocery store. I would try to go late at night. I would try to go when I thought certain people might be working and they wouldn't be there. I'm just being honest about it. I would. I was hiding out. I did not want to face any of those people, get into a discussion with them about anything that had happened. I just didn't want to see them. I mean, I'm just being honest. I'm being real here. And it was unforgiveness is what caused all that. I was letting this past event control me. And instead, I should have found it in my heart to forgive whatever I perceived was the hurt they had caused me and others and move on with love. That's what I should have done. It's taken me a long time to be able to be confronted by some of those people or run into them at the store and not freeze up or, you know, not try to go down another aisle or, you know, well, I'm just being honest about it because I was very hurt. But if we want to be forgiven, 
we have to forgive. There's just no two ways about it. It says it in the Word. But if we want to be forgiven by God, we have to be able to forgive other people. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to be best buddies with people that maybe we felt hurt us or did us wrong. That doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that we have to have a forgiving heart, and if we can't, we need to go to God and ask Him, help me forgive. And it's a process, and it doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't. A lot of people, I think, can testify to that. Um, as the saying goes, forgiven people must be forgiving people. The Lord promises that he'll remember our sins no more, and that's in Jeremiah 31, 34. But is that how we forgive? Probably not. Because as far as, you know, not the remembering part anyway, we still remember things. We're human, and, and we remember things. Our minds are not made up in a way where we can totally forget. But we can forgive and we can release it to God and let Him take over. Um, in working through the process of forgiveness, asking the Lord to help us forgive, the pain can become less and less. And eventually we don't think about it all the time. It's not We're not dwelling on it all the time. You know, we may, thought might cross our mind occasionally, but, but we can let it go pretty easy. And honestly, we should be so humbled by the price that Jesus paid for us that we ought to have a deep desire to forgive. That ought to be within us, just because of the price he paid. Um, authentic forgiveness requires that we identify what has happened. This is just a little thing, that you, some questions you can ask yourself about whatever the issue is. Number one, how serious was the offense? Is this something I or the other person needs to repent of? Is it something I've done wrong I need to repent for? Is it something they may need to repent for, which we don't have a whole lot of control over? But um, So that's number one. Number two is how raw is the wound? Where, where am I at in my forgiveness process? And don't be picking the scab all the time instead of the book. <laughs> I thought that was really good, mm -hmm. you know. How raw is the wound, how fresh is the wound, and don't be picking the scab if it's healed. <laughs> don't be bringing it up all the time. <clears throat> how close is this person to you, and how significant is, is it that you want to see mending in the relationship? And how significant is the relationship to me? These questions are all important in bringing closure to an issue that has the power to control my present and my future. We have to think about that and everything. How is this affecting my health? How is this affecting my other relationships? All those kind of things. We have to think about how is it affecting my present today and how is it going to affect me in the future? We must be compelled to forgive because the Lord has forgiven us and forgives us and forgives us and forgives us and forgives us over and over and over. <clears throat> and the last thing I want to talk about is called forbearance. And I'm going to give you a couple different definitions of what forbearance means. The first one is kind of a worldly definition of forbearance. And the second one is more biblical. The first one is postponing or reducing payments on a loan. Though the interest keeps accruing and the loan is still due, but you're just not making payments. Okay. In other words, I may not make you pay for this now, but your day is coming and the interest is growing. <laughs> So in other words, you're going to pay, and you're going to pay big when, when it all comes, <laughs> comes down to it. Kind of think of all the student loans over the years that you hear about have been defaulted on, you know, by people that go to college and never pay their money back. The second one, forbearance, is the more biblical one. And it is putting up with the weaknesses, frailties, and failings of others without charging it to their account or making it a big issue. That's how we're supposed to we're supposed to forbear one another. Um, we're supposed to look over their weaknesses, frailties, and failings because don't we know if we're pointing the finger at them, it can be pointed right back at us because we all have weaknesses, frailties, and failures, failings. So we all know which one of those sounds more like the way Jesus would do it. So not everything is about forgiveness. We need to learn to put up with differences, mistakes, and failures of other people. 
and then we don't maybe hold a grudge, and then maybe we don't hold have an odd against our brother if we are uh, sensitive to their differences with us, their mistakes and their failures, and remember that we have them too. In 1 Peter 4 a, Paul says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. So it comes back to love. Always comes back to love. We've talked about that a lot. Um, if we can have love, like Christ has for us, then forgiveness shouldn't be an issue at all. So that's all I have tonight. And if you want to have prayer over the food. And Amen. Awesome lesson.